Hello everybody and welcome to Books with Ike. My name is Isaac and today I'm going to be doing my wrap-up for the second half of 2021. I may split this into two videos depending on how long it is, I'm not sure at the moment. But before I get into that, I want to explain why it's been such a long time since I last filmed a video. And it's basically just the university kicked my ass. <laughs> I just didn't have time to film any videos, uh, I, like, stopped reading for, like, the first half of this year, and I didn't read much last year either. So yeah, my plan is to do this video on all of the books that I read in the second half of 2021, then I'm gonna do a massive book haul video on every book I've obtained since my last haul. It's gonna be a lot of books. And then I'm going to do a video on all of the books that I've read so far this year. And after that, we'll see. I might get around to doing some of those tag videos that I was tagged in ages and ages ago. But I might not. We'll see. And so, without wasting any more time, let's get into the books I read for the second half of last year. Now, because I read some of these books literally over a year ago, I'm going to be referring to my Goodreads notes, and in some cases reviews, so if you see me looking to the side, that's what that's about, and if you can hear my computer fan, sorry. So I read two books in June, and the first of those was Ink and Bone by Rachel Kane, the first book in the Great Library series, and this is a reread for me. This is an alternate universe sort of sci-fantasy, steampunk, cyberpunk thing set in a world where the Library of Alexandria never burned down and now is an organisation with a monopoly on books and knowledge. And the private ownership of books is banned. And this follows Jess Brightwell, who is the son of a London book dealer who illegally sells books. And Jess's dad doesn't really like him that much, so he decides that the most valuable place for Jess to be for the family will be inside the Great Library, sending them rare texts. So he sends Jess to become a scholar for the library, and he tells him that if he doesn't make it as a scholar, he shouldn't come back home either. So what surprised me when I read this was that I basically remembered the entire plot beat for beat, and so I can't really talk about the effectiveness of the plot twists or how surprising it is or anything like that, because I genuinely don't remember. I went into this already knowing everything that was going to happen. But what I really didn't remember was that this book is relentlessly bleak and just brutal the entire way through. There's like one tiny glimmer of hope in the entire book, and it comes after like the most depressing scene ever. Everything else is overshadowed by the dystopian oppressiveness of the library. There's this constant sense of threat and danger that just hangs over the book, and it's really well done. There are some plot elements that I can call out as not working so well, I think, because there are these little epistolary interludes, uh, which are labelled ephemera, in between the chapters of the main story, and generally the ephemera will spoil the main story, like, it will tell the reader a plot twist before it happens, and it's just weird. And the story would undoubtedly work better without it. Something I will say about the plot is that while I remembered literally everything that happened in this book, I was never bored on my reread. Which I think means that the plot is pretty strong and compelling on its own and doesn't rely on things like plot twists to keep you engaged. So yeah, that's a good thing. The world building in this book is absolutely fantastic, and the way the influence of the library seeps into every level of society is just so well realised. And there's this really clear sense of the history of the world, and like, the international conflicts and stuff, and it's just excellently done. Jess is a fairly compelling protagonist. He's a reluctant criminal. He's very caring and sensitive, but he's also cunning and intelligent and pragmatic, while also being quite selfish and naive at the same time. 
So his character is full of very interesting contradictions. All of the other postulants, is what they're called, the people who are applying to be scholars in the library, are fairly one-note, but they're quite endearing in the way that they're portrayed. But the best character is the postulant's teacher, mentor type figure called Scholar Wolf. And he at first seems like your kind of typical bullying teacher, but there's a lot of hidden complexity to his character which slowly gets revealed as the story goes on. He's basically the Snape archetype, but he's not a scumbag. Um, <laughs> the romance in this book is fairly interesting. The characters have chemistry and complementary personalities and they fit together well, so it wasn't a terrible romance, but it wasn't one that I was particularly invested in. I do think it adds to the story, but I don't particularly care about it. But overall I thoroughly enjoyed this book. It has great world building, interesting characters, a fantastic atmosphere, and a really engaging story and overall I gave it four stars. I have written a full review for this book, which I will leave a link for in the description. When it comes to content warnings, for some reason I just stopped putting them in my Goodreads reviews, and I obviously don't have a perfect memory, so I will include as many content warnings as I can think of in the description for all of these books, but be aware that I probably will miss some, because I just didn't make a note of them at the time of reading, and it was so long ago. The other book I read in June was Swords Point by Ellen Kushner, which is a classic when it comes to queer fantasy. This is about a duelist called Richard St. Vere, and in the city this story is set, the aristocracy settle their disputes by hiring swordsmen to fight each other, sometimes to the death. And the story begins just after St. Vere has won a duel and killed two men. But this causes a scandal in the city because no one knows what the duel was over. And everyone has their own theories and they're all gossiping and trying to work out what's actually going on. Whereas Richard kind of just wants to forget about it and move on with his life because it was just a job to him and he doesn't care. And Richard is living with his boyfriend, who is this very self-destructive, melancholic sort of guy with a very mysterious past. The plot of this book is quite frustrating because it keeps a sense of mystery by just making everything vague. Like, all of the conversations are vague, all of the characters' motivations are vague. And it's not like, it's not like a cop-out, it's not like Ellen Kushner didn't know what she was writing. It's that all of these characters are in this world where no one speaks plainly. They are always double-talking and backstabbing, and it's very frustrating to read sometimes, because you're just like, what is going on? And so it's quite disappointing that the main antagonist's motivation ends up being very shallow. That doesn't mean the plot isn't engaging, it very much is. There are tons of great scenes and the climax is incredible. And the other plot line is what sustained most of my interest in this book, which was the mystery of who Alec is. And Alec is Richard's boyfriend. I did mostly work it out before the book actually revealed the truth, but it was very late in the book that I worked it out, and it didn't hinder my enjoyment of the story. The world building is pretty interesting, but there's this odd detail of it being queer normative for men. Like, nearly every male character in this book is bisexual, but none of the female characters are anything other than straight, and that's really weird. Apparently later books in the Riverside series address this and make it better, but as it is, it's a fairly uncomfortable detail. The characters are absolutely fascinating because they're like indiscriminately terrible people, and the romance between Richard and Alec is toxic as all hell. They're like mutual enablers who like encourage the other's worst impulses, but it's such an interesting relationship that you can't help but root for it anyway. One of the main characters seems to just disappear from relevance towards the end of the book. Like, his storyline just kind of fizzles out, and it makes you just wonder what was the point in making him a main character in the first place. 
But overall, I did really enjoy this and I gave it four stars. And after reading Sword's Point, I read the three short stories which are in the back of this book. The first one is The Swordsman Whose Name Was Not Death, which was interesting, but the plot suffered from the same sort of vagueness that uh, Sword's Point did. The second one was Red Cloak, and that was my favourite of the three, which is interesting because it was also the shortest. It had really fun character interactions, and it was the first hint at something actually supernatural existing in this world, which was very interesting. And what's even more interesting was that Red Cloak was apparently the very first thing she ever wrote for the Riverside world, which is just intriguing. And the last one was The Death of the Duke, which was depressing and I hated it, but it was also a very good story. The writing style was incredible, it was very atmospheric and sort of bleak. And this time it used vagary to its advantage by building up the mystery slowly until it reveals its twists. So yeah, it was a very good story, but also I wish it didn't exist. And so I gave The Swordsman Whose Name Was Not Death three stars, and I gave the other two short stories four stars each. And then I also read two books in July, and the first of those was Mr. Impossible by Maggie Steve Utter. This is the second book in the Dreamer trilogy, which is the sequel to The Raven Cycle, and I can't really talk about the plot of this because it would spoil The Raven Cycle, but it's about dream magic and stuff like that. And because this is a sequel, I didn't really write any notes on it, and I don't really remember enough to talk about specifics, really but I do know that I really enjoyed it. I thought the character development for Declan was amazing, and also the relationship development between him and Jordan, that was also great. I kind of like Carmen now, whereas I hated her in the first book. And the development for Ronan was really interesting, and I'm intrigued to see where it will go from here. And like, the final plot twists leave you with so many questions. So I can't wait to see how this series wraps up. And yeah, I gave this 4.5 stars. And so the second book I read in July was Royal Assassin by Robin Hobb, which is the second book in the Farseer trilogy, which is the first series in the realm of the Elderlings. And the first book, Assassin's Apprentice, is about a bastard son of a prince who is left at the royal castle by his maternal grandfather, who has gotten tired of raising him, and thinks the prince should take responsibility for it. Instead, the prince abdicates the throne and leaves, and so the boy is raised by the prince's stable master, Burik, until eventually the king takes notice of the boy and decides to have him trained as an assassin. So yeah, I really enjoyed the first book, I gave it 4.5 out of 5 stars, and I also gave this 4.5 out of 5 stars. The plot was incredible, but it drags so much, there are a lot of pacing issues in this story. It's very twisty and turny, but the twists and turns it takes are pretty predictable, and, like, it kind of makes the characters seem like idiots. That said, I did love the character development in this book. I no longer despise Shrewd. Patience became one of my favourite characters. Katrickan was great. The Fool got loads more to do in this, and he was also incredible. And while I don't care for the romance between her and Fitz, I really love Molly as a character, and I think she made the right decisions for herself. What the Elderlings are seemed pretty obvious to me, and I have since read the third book and I know I'm right. So the way it was treated like a mystery just felt a bit weird. There's some foreshadowing about forging and the red and white ships that says it should have been obvious to the characters at the time what that was all about, but knowing what I know now, it really isn't. <laughs> it really shouldn't have been, it's a quite obscure, you know, connection. I mean, it makes sense, but it... It's not obvious. <laughs> but yeah, the ending of this book was absolutely incredible, and I couldn't wait to see how it continued. But you're gonna have to wait until my early 2022 wrap-up to find out what I thought of the last book. But yeah, anyway, I really enjoyed this and I gave it 4.5 stars. And the first book I read in August was Lord Brocktree by Brian Jacks. And this is, of course, a Redwall book. I loved Redwall as a kid, but over time I fell out of love with it because I grew tired of the formulaic plots and the black and white morality. But I've been wanting to reread the entire Redwall series for a while, and there was this thing going on called the Booktube Spin, and 
I put this on my list and it came up. So this was a reread for me. So this is chronologically the first Red Wall story. It predates the actual founding of the Abbey itself. And this is about a Badger Lord called Lord Brocktree, who is the son of Lord Stonepaw, the current reigning Badger Lord. And the Badger Lords reign over this mountain called Salamandastron, which is all mystical and magical, and Lord Brocktree has been feeling the call of the mountain. So he goes out on a quest to find it, and along the way he runs into a young hare called Dorothea, and she becomes his travelling companion, because she's also been sent to Salamandastron by her parents. But all is not well, because Salamandastron is besieged by the wildcat warlord Ungat Trun, and Lord Stonepaw only has a tiny force of hares left to defend the mountain, so he sends out his most trusted companion Fleetscut to find young hares and bring them to the mountain. And yeah, this was alright. It was a Red Wall book. I knew what I was getting into, and I got exactly what I expected. It's not particularly strong, but it's not particularly weak either. Dorothea, aka Dottie, is actually quite a charming, likeable character. There are some interesting side characters, such as Grodil, Ungatrun's fox spiritualist advisor kind of guy, and King Bucko Big Bones, who is a, a mad march hare from the mountains. So yeah, it's fun, but I wasn't really engaged with the story until about a third of the way through. And I do think that the tournament arc in the middle of the story does save this book from being just bland. Red Wall always relies on, like, puzzles and riddles, and the ones in this book just aren't that interesting. I don't know if it's just because I'm not the intended age demographic for them anymore. And Ungat Trun, while he at first seems to be a quite interesting villain who is competent and cunning and seems to have some sense of honour and respect for his opponents, but this quickly disappears and he just becomes this one-note villain of pure evil who must be destroyed. And the ending of this book is just anticlimactic. But yeah, again, it wasn't terrible. It, it was a Red War book. It was what I expected of it, uh, and I gave it three stars. I did write a full review for this book, which I will leave a link for in the description. And the next book I read in August was another childhood reread, and that was The Fire Within by Chris DeLacy, the first book in The Last Dragon Chronicles. This is about a student called David who moves into the spare room of a woman called Liz Pennykettle, and Liz and her daughter Lucy are a bit strange. Liz makes dragons out of clay, and the house is covered with them, but Lucy seems to imply they're just a bit more than pretty ornaments. And as strange things start to happen, David kind of starts to believe it. And it's also about rescuing a squirrel from the perils of suburban living. Um, <laughs> it was fun, it's cute, it has some pretty nice atmospheric and emotional writing. It honestly has some pacing issues as well, like it starts to feel a little bit dragged out at points which is interesting considering it's this long. The characters are likeable and entertaining, if one-dimensional. The relationships they form are cute. The romance is underdeveloped, but I don't really expect developed romance from a middle grade story, so I don't really care that much. The main problem with it, though, is that you really don't learn anything about David. It's like implied that he's a geography student. It's implied that he plays guitar. You know that he's caring, you know that he's creative, you know that he's awkward. That's really all you know about him for the whole book. But yeah, it was fun and I gave it three stars. And then the next book I read in August was The Darkness Outside Us by Elliot Schreffer. And just look at that cover, it's great, isn't it? So this is a sci-fi space survival story about a guy called Ambrose Cusk, whose sister was the first settler on the moon of Titan, and the Earth has just received a distress call from his sister, and so they are sending this ship to go and rescue her. But there's something that's not quite right. There's evidence that other people have been in the ship, which is, of course, impossible. And his ship has been attached to another ship, which is also manned by a single person, and they're doing, like, a co-rescue mission between the two remaining, I guess, economic blocks left on Earth after some unspecified amount of time. I'm sure the amount of time actually is specified, but I don't remember what it is. But his crewmate has barricaded his half of the ship, closed, and won't open the door. 
So yeah, there's mysterious and unsettling things going on, and Ambrose has to work out what's going on and make sure that his mission succeeds. So yeah, the mysterious and unsettling atmosphere is built brilliantly from the first page onwards. The plot is great and the mystery unfolds really satisfyingly, but as you get closer to the end of the book it becomes pretty easy to predict. But before that, the story really keeps you on your toes and there are some real gut punch moments. The characters are great, but they're really difficult to get invested in for reasons that should be obvious if you've read the book. I also don't really buy the romance, I understand the lust aspect of it, but it really feels like a bond of necessity than anything deeper, and that's not that interesting to me. But the world building is pretty interesting, and it handles its themes pretty well, and overall I thought it was a pretty good book, and I gave it four stars. And then in September I read The Root by Naaman Goba Tilhun, or Tilhun and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and this is the first book in the Wrath and Athenium series. And this is really complicated and difficult to talk about, so it has two main characters. One of them is in modern-day San Francisco, and the other one is in San Francisco's sort of mirror city, underworld sort of thing called Zibub. And if you can tell from the name, yes, it's fairly demonic. And so the main character in San Francisco, Eric, is a former child star who quit his job after an unspecified scandal, and he's out and about at night when he sees a child being kidnapped by a monster. A horrific monster. And his instincts kick in, and he attacks the monster. And it turns out that he has strange powers, and is apparently descended from the gods. And then there is Lil, who is the apprentice of the holder of one of the Athenians, and the Athenians are like these libraries, centres of learning, and they're also sanctuaries for people, because this world is ruled over by the Angelics, who are like these, basically, demonic figures. I believe they're called Angelics anyway, I could be wrong, it was a while since I read it. And they oppress the humans, but there is a mysterious force which is destroying this world, and the holders of the Athenians are being called to the capital of this world so that they can investigate the cause and try and put a stop to it. And because Lil is the apprentice of one of the holders, she is also involved in this effort. And so it turns out that a shadowy government organization in our world is selling the descendants of gods to the Angelics for unspecified experiments. But there is also a faction of these god-descended people who is trying to fight against that. So yeah, it's really complicated. The main characters are pretty great, they're very engaging and complex. Arel and Jaggi and their relationship with Lil's sisters is really cute. There's some really interesting world building and some incredible designs for the creatures, for the angelics, they're really interesting. Like, they're so imaginative and they're just really different to anything else I've read, pretty much. The plot was interesting, but it was a bit disjointed and too fast, I think. Eric's relationship with his ex-boyfriend Daniel is really interesting, but the book doesn't really deal with it very well. But the modern day romance was really boring and didn't have any chemistry between the main characters, so... Bleh. But it, w it was a pretty interesting portrayal of black queer rage, is what I would call it, because if it wasn't clear, Eric is gay. And I'm pretty sure Lil is possibly asexual, I don't know. But it's definitely all about injustice and raging against injustice, and it's great at that. But yeah, I thought it was a really interesting book, I am looking forward to the sequel, and I gave it 3.5 stars. And then in October, I read An Ember in the Ashes by Sabah Tahir. I originally gave this 4 stars, and my notes say possibly 4.5 stars, and I don't know why <laughs> the, the possibly 4.5 stars was there, because it really doesn't deserve them. I would say I would drop this down to a 3.5 or possibly even a 3 stars. So this is about a girl called Lyre, who lives with her grandparents and her brother, and her grandparents are murdered, and 
her brother is arrested by the brutal martial empire who her people, the scholars, have been subjugated by. And so she tries to join up with the resistance to free her brother from prison, but in return they want her to pretend to be a slave and spy on the commandant of Black Cliff Academy, which is where the elite soldiers of the Empire are trained. And one of these elite soldiers is a boy called Elias, and Elias doesn't want to be one of these elite soldiers anymore, and plans to desert. And of course, eventually, Lyra and Elias meet each other, and things progress from there. The actual plot of this book is incredible. It has loads of twists and turns, and really unexpected and dramatic scenes. The characters are okay, but I don't really care about them. The world building is mostly pretty cheesy, like the bad guys are called the Martial Empire, and the good guys are called the Scholars. Like, that's a bit too on the nose for me. But there is some interesting stuff outside that. It gets pretty dark and disturbing and brutal in some places. The overarching threat of the series isn't really focused on enough, I don't think. And like, the return of magic to the world is treated so casually instead of just this massive, game-changing thing that it really should be. I mean, I read it a long time ago, so I don't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure there was this whole thing about the Marshal stamping out, like, this folk magic sort of stuff. But then they just accept it when it comes back, it's really weird. And there's some really frustrating bits where information is kept from the characters purely for the sake of keeping it from the reader, and it feels really artificial. So yeah, overall I have pretty conflicted feelings about this book. The story itself is really well done, but the characters were just okay, and the world building was handled pretty badly. And so yeah, as I said, I gave it four stars at the time but I would probably drop that down to a 3.5, or maybe just a 3. And then the other book I read in October was The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, which I read for uni, and I really enjoyed it. I didn't expect to at all. But it had excellent world-building, really nice prose, an interesting and tense story, some brilliant imagery, some interesting theories about economics and social progress, I don't think they were right, but they were interesting. And it also sort of hints towards the theory of carcinization <laughs> at the end, which is very fun. There weren't really any characters, um, but yeah, it was good, and I gave it four stars. And then, skipping all the way to December, I read A Single Man by Christopher Isherwood, and this is a queer classic about a single man, a man called George, who is just going through his life, mourning the death of his long-time boyfriend. You never really find out what happened to him, it's not that important. And just thinking about how to move on with his life after that. And it's very interesting. The prose is a bit impenetrable to begin with, but once you get over that, you really start flying through it. It's very interesting. The main character, George, is an excellent protagonist. He's very deep and complex and surprisingly relatable in a lot of ways. The book provides an interesting view of 60s attitudes towards queerness, which, if you don't already know them, you probably won't expect. It surprised me. It's also very emotional, and the story itself, while it's secondary to the themes that Isherwood was wanting to portray, is still very compelling. And speaking of the themes, I don't quite understand them. <laughs> Maybe because I am not, you know, a middle-aged man. Maybe because I'm so much younger than the protagonist and the author. But yeah, I do want to go back and read it when I'm 50 and see what I think then. But as it is, I really enjoyed it and I gave it four stars. And the next book I read in December was Yellow, Volume 1 by Makoto Tateno. And this is a sort of contemporary story about these two guys who are... They're called drug snatchers, and I think they just... I don't know if they work for the police or what, but they work for someone, and they find drugs for him and basically steal them from criminals. And one of them, Go, is openly gay, and Taki is very much...
much straight, and Go is clearly openly in love with Tucky, but Tucky wants nothing to do with him. Well, not, not nothing to do with him, but he doesn't want a relationship with him. So yeah, that's the basic plot. This was my first yaoi manga, it was my first manga in general, actually, and I chose this one because it sounded more, you know, equal and less problematic than what you typically expect from a yaoi. Like, the characters are both very equal, they're both masculine, and there's no, like, semi-yuki dynamic, except at least not yet. And while that is all true, it dives headfirst into all of the other problematic yaoi things. And there will be slight spoilers in this, because I'm not really sure how to talk about this manga without them. So if you don't want anything spoiled about this, feel free to skip it. But yeah, like I said, it dives like headfirst into all of the problematic things. Go constantly sexually harasses and assaults Taki. There might have been like something consensual initiated by Taki, but it was really unclear from the framing, and it was only once. There is rape in this, but it's not between the main characters, so at least there's that. There's a random incest subplot for no reason, and Taki will openly admit to being in love with Go, though obviously not to Go, but still insists that he's straight. So it's sort of portraying him as like biromantic or just bisexual and in denial, but I kind of doubt that Makoto Tateno knows what either of those things are, or at least didn't at the time she was writing this, and the series will probably say he's gay while portraying him as bisexual. That's what I feel is going to happen. The plot is fun, but it's nothing special. I don't really care about the characters too much. There was one quite interesting side character though, and when it comes to like the actual visual aspects of it, the art was sometimes great, and it was sometimes awful, but it was mostly just meh, and there were some parts of it where the speech bubbles were laid out in a confusing way and you couldn't tell who was talking, but all of that being said, it was a cheap, fun popcorn read, and I kind of want to continue with it, you know? It's junk food. It's not good for you. <laughs> um, and don't take any lessons from it. But it's kind of interesting. <laughs> um, in the, like, what fucked up thing can happen next kind of way. And I am intrigued- oh fuck, it's upside down. But yeah, and I am intrigued to see what happens with the main romance, so I might continue with it. I might not, though. But yeah, I gave this two stars. And finally, the last book I read in 2021 was The Wicked and the Divine, Volume 1, The Faust Act, by Akiran Gillen, Jamie McKelvey, Matthew Wilson, and Clayton Cowles. And this is incredible. So this is set in a world where every 90 years, a pantheon of gods is reincarnated into a human form, and they will live as celebrities for the time that they are on Earth, but within two years, they will all die. And this story follows a girl called Laura, who is a fangirl for the gods, like a groupie, really, who goes to all the concerts and things. And some stuff happens, and she ends up investigating which of the gods framed Lucifer for murder, and Lucifer is obviously one of the gods. The art in this is stunning, the character designs are all really creative and interesting, the characters themselves are really interesting, and I can't wait to see how they develop, especially Laura, she's an excellent protagonist. The world building is really creative and clever, and the plot is really interesting, and I can't begin to figure out the answers to the mystery, and I'm just intrigued to see where it goes and I can't wait to read the next volume. Overall, this was amazing, and I gave it five stars. So yeah, that was every book I read between my last wrap-up and the end of 2021. I'm not gonna take that again. If you've read any of these books, I'd love to hear what you thought. <laughs> Fucking hell. If you've read any of these books, I'd love to hear what you thought about them, so please leave that in the comments below, and also tell me what some books you read, not necessarily in 2021, <laughs> but just recently. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. You can follow me on Twitter or at me as a friend on Goodreads if you feel like it. Links to both of those in the description. Feel free to message me on Goodreads. I'm always around. I'm like terminally online. And I will hopefully have another video up soon. It should be my book haul for all of the books that I've obtained between my last book haul and now, which is a lot of books. But until then, thank you for watching. I've been Isaac and this has been Books with Ike. Goodbye.